frankly, it should be named the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit was the one doing all these things. The book of Acts has become perhaps the, my favorite book in the whole Bible. Because it tells us about the history of the early church. How the church got started. I want to start reading with you on chapter number 1. Chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Now, the person that wrote this book was Luke. Luke, and of course he wrote the Gospel of Luke. He says, until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many invaluable proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen today. We celebrated Easter a few weeks back. He's alive forevermore. Verse 4 says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait of the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day you have given us to enjoy it. Thank you for allowing us to be here in this place to worship you and to encourage each other. I pray for the blessed Holy Spirit to minister to our needs. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So here he's, t he's telling the, the history of the church. He wrote the book of Luke, first of all, to tell about the life of Jesus Christ. And now he's writing this second book telling Theophilus about the history of the early church. Like I mentioned, Jesus Christ, he came, he died, he was buried, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. He is not dead, he is alive. God is not dead. He is alive forevermore, praise his name. But then he goes on and he tells about what Jesus told his disciples. Look at verse 6, it says, When they therefore were come together, they ask of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? The Jewish people were very consumed with the idea of the millennium kingdom. And once again, the disciples ask Jesus this question. Are you now, at this very moment, going to establish that millennium kingdom? They were very anxious to find out. And Jesus tells them, and he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father had put in his own power. And sometimes we also are consumed with things that we want to know. And we come to God and we say, God, is this the time or whatever it is? And I believe that God will tell us the same thing. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons. Just be faithful which that that I have given to your care. Just do the things that I have commanded you to do. It reminds me of, of some, one of the apostles talking about John. Jesus was telling, talking about John, how he might be living longer than all of them. And, and they were consumed about that thought. Say, you know what, we don't understand that. And Jesus told him, told, I think it was Peter, say, don't worry about John. Don't worry about him. Just do the things that you're supposed to be doing. And if we all would get that concept, just be concerned with the things that God has told you to do. And get busy doing those things. Don't get so consumed about everybody else's lives. Don't be a busybody. 
gossiping and talking about, I wonder what he's doing. I wonder what that happened to him or whatever the case may be. That is not very constructive. Just be concerned with the things that God has revealed to you from his word that he wants you to do. And, he, and then he says, he's, he's going to pivot, and he says, but instead of being so consumed with the beginning of the millennium kingdom, don't be so consumed about that, but this is what you need to be concerned about. And he's going to tell them here. He says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. That is the one thing that Jesus Christ wanted them to be engaged in. Don't worry about the Millennium Kingdom. That's going to happen in God's own timing. Just, just, just let God be concerned about that. But what I want you to be concerned about is this idea of being my witnesses. And I've been talking about this for some time now. It's a very important concept. We just heard that song. The mission. God wants us to share the gospel across the street and around the world. Say, so how can I share the gospel around the world? Well, when we give money towards missions, that money is being used to financially support other people that are going to these faraway places. Throughout my years, I have met many, many people that have given their lives to go out to faraway places to share the gospel with those people. That's a, in a way, it's a sacrifice because you're away from your family. You know, somebody who's in Africa today or Europe or Asia, they're not with their family here in the States. There's a separation that takes place. But if that's the place that God has for you to serve, then you better go and do it, right? You better go and do what God is calling you to do. But also, it's not only a sacrifice in, in that regard, but it is also a great privilege that these individuals have to share the gospel with others that have never heard before. But the same thing applies to us, you see. We were talking about this in Sunday school today. You know, sometimes uh, we get scared and afraid, and we do not share when God is prompting us to do so. I told you before, this uh, tax season, I was doing taxes for people, and, and the different people would come to my office, and they will have me work with them to do their, get their taxes done. Well, from time to time, the Lord would impress upon me to talk to them about the Lord. Just last week, this dear lady came in, and she was having a lot of different challenges that she was facing. And the Lord prompted me to pray with her at the end of that encounter. I don't pray with everybody that comes into my office. <laughs> but I have done so several times this tax season. Because the Lord impressed me to do so. You know why she was very, I mean she was in tears. After I got done praying with her. Not only her, but other people this tax season. That the Lord impressed me to pray for them. The Lord impressed me to give them a track. Hey, I want to give you this so you can read it and learn more about God. You see, and, and, and that didn't take a whole lot of time from my schedule. But it made a great impact in her life. She got a lot more than she counted on when she came to my office. She got a lot more. Because I took a little bit of time... <coughs> And I care for her, and I show compassion towards her. And it was a blessing to her. You see, when we go out and we, and we encounter people uh, in the workplace, we encounter people in the marketplace, and we encounter people in whatever we may be. You know, I believe, I told you before, that when we walk into any place, 
that play should be a better play because you are a believer. If you're a believer, you have the blessed Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you. He's the light of the world. And when we walk into any place, the environment, the atmosphere in that place should change for the better. And we should let people know, you know, sometimes I know or I have a very good inclination that somebody may be a believer. Why? Because of the way that they behave. The way that they talk. The way that they, they, they dress. Those are messages that you're sending to other people. God did not call us to be theologians. I'll tell you that before. Do not be consumed with the idea that you do not know everything that there is to know about the Bible. I certainly do not. I do not know everything that there is to know about this book. And you know why? I'm going to tell you a secret. I never will. I will never understand the unsearchable riches of the Word of God completely and fully. I would not. Some of those things I would not understand until I get to heaven <laughs> and God reveals them to me. But I am not going to use that as an excuse not to share with others what I do understand. You see, there are some things that I do understand. I do understand that one day, when I was about to go to sleep on my, on my house, one night, when I was 14 years old, I was about to go to sleep, and the Holy Spirit was working heavily on my life, showing me that I needed to get right with God. I needed to make peace with God. And that night, I prayed to God and asked Him to forgive me of my sins. I asked Him, please forgive I need you to come and, 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 and rescue me. I want to have fellowship with you. I want to make you my leader that I want to follow after. I want you to change my life. I want you to make me one of your children. I don't need to understand the whole concept of God to tell somebody that. What am I doing? I'm simply telling them what God has done in my own personal life. And so it is with you. God wants you to share with others what he has done for you in your own personal life. Verse 9 says, And when he had spoken these things, what they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And when they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by, by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. That was a prophecy of the second coming of Jesus Christ. One day, Jesus Christ is coming back, and his food is going to put down the man of olives, and that will be the beginning of his millennium kingdom. He's coming back again to set up his kingdom. Do we know when, this, when that's going to be? No, we don't know. And we should not be worried and concerned about that day. Because only God knows when that's going to take place. What he wants us to do is to be busy proclaiming the message of salvation, what he has done for us. Verse 12 says, Then return they unto Jerusalem from the mount called the Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. So when Christ comes back, he's going to touch down on that very same place that he ascended up to heaven. Verse 13 says, And when they were come in, they went 
up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Selots and Judas the brother of James. Those were 11 of the apostles. Of course, you know what happened to the 12th one, right? He was Judas Iscariot. He betrayed Christ, and he took his own life. Well, look at verse 12. This all continue with one accord. Now, the idea of one accord has the idea of unity. That is another theme that I've been, that I've been uh, preaching to you about a lot. I want our church to be united. To be united. Come together. Okay? The devil is always trying to draw us apart. He's always trying to get us to have conflict with each other. If that's the case today, in your life, if you have a conflict with a fellow believer, you need to make that right. You need to ask God to help you to be restored with that other person. Because what God desires among us is for us to have a core, to be united. This all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication. That is the key of the early church, my friends. Prayer, supplication, fasting. They were serious about their Christian walk with God. With the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. That was a very important aspect of the early church. They took time to pray. You know, I encourage you, if you're able, to come and be part of our Wednesday evening prayer time that we have here at our church. We come together, we have a time of prayer, and then we have a short time learning about God's word. It has been great. We come, we sing silly songs sometimes. We have a lot of laughs. We praise the Lord together. We encourage one another. And when we leave, we are, we are uh, revved up. <laughs> we, are, we are feeling better. Uh, we we encourage. They, these people, they got together on a daily basis. I mean, daily, they will come together and pray and encourage one another because, because they, you know, there was great opposition towards them. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. So Jesus Christ, before he went back to heaven, he told him, I want you to wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Ghost comes down from heaven. Just wait. Now, Jesus Christ, once he was raised from the dead, he dwelt among them for 40 days. Okay, at the end of 40 days, he went back up to heaven. Well, about 10 days later is when the day of Pentecost took place. It was 50 days after the, the Passover. Verse 1 says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Once again, this idea that they are all together. They're all united with each other. If we are not united, we are going to be very limited on what we can do for God. Because if we are not united, you know what that means? That we are disunited. <laughs> it's, not, it's not very... It's not a very profound concept. If you're not united, you are disunited. It means you're going different ways. Okay, you have different goals. You have different purposes, and so on. No, God wants us to be united with one accord, going in the same place, the same direction. It says, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appear unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And he sat upon each of them. 
and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So here, just as Christ has said, just as Christ had promised, he told them, I am going to go back to heaven to my Father, but I will send you a comforter, and he will remind you of the things that I have taught you. He will encourage you. He will comfort you. He will be your companion as you go about doing the things that I'm asking you to do. And so it was. The Holy Ghost came upon them. The Holy Ghost indwelled them. You know, the Bible tells us that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not indwell this building. He does not. The Holy Spirit indwells the bodies of those people that have been reconciled with God through Jesus Christ. He indwells those bodies. That's why it's so important for us as believers to take good care of our bodies. Okay? Just, just maintain it. Just, just keep it, just keep it running smoothly, if you will. You know, I, I, and I know that that we as as humans, we have been cursed by sin, and we have sicknesses and diseases that we have to encounter from time to time, and it's going to debilitate and weaken our bodies. And there will come the time that we are going to be very much, maybe even bed rested. I understand that. Brother Joe, Nelms, and myself, we went out and we visited some of those people that cannot make it here anymore. We saw Miss Evelyn, didn't we, Brother Joe? She kept saying, I wish I could be at church. I wish I could be at church, didn't she? She misses being here so very much. But she cannot come anymore because she has those health limitations. You see? But as long as we are able, as long as we have the strength, I believe that God wants us to come together and encourage each other. So he gave them tongues. You know, tongues is a very uh, controversial topic in the scriptures. But here uh, we see that these tongues that were given to them were languages that were known languages. Let's keep reading here. It says, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. These people were coming from all over the place to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. Now, when this was noised abroad, what was taking place in that upper room, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. This was not gibberish that they were talking or speaking. This was a known language. They were speaking, they were speaking in, uh, I'm just making this up, they were maybe speaking in German or English or Chinese or Portuguese and you know, all these languages that, that are known languages today. And they were all amazed and marveled saying one to another, Behold, are not all these we speak Galileans. These are unlearned people. How come they're speaking these languages? They were surprised, confounded. And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? And then he goes on and gives this long list of countries and places that these people were coming from. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia in Pontus in Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya and Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. You see, these were known languages that they were speaking. And these foreigners that came, 
they, they were hearing their own language being spoken. And they were all amazed and were, were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. You know, I see in the Bible, there are times in, in the Bible when a new dispensation begins. You may have heard that term, dispensation. A dispensation is a period of time that God relates to people in a different way than he did the period before. And you have different dispensations throughout the scriptures. But typically when you go from one dispensation to the other one, there, there, there's, a, there's a transition period. And typically God uses wonders and miracles such as this to authenticate his messengers. These people knew that these were ignorant men. They didn't go to school to learn how to speak this language. How come they're able to do it? It was a supernatural ability that made them be able to do it. You see, God did something supernatural to uh, authenticate these are my people. These are not funny people. They're not crooks. They're, they're not funnies. They are, they're, they're for real. And they're doing these things based on my power. And Peter goes on to speak. Says, uh, verse 14 says, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day, or nine o'clock in the morning. And then he closes up. Look, look at verse 37, same chapter. Now when they heard this, and, and Peter gave them a, a, a speech about Christ, how they have crucified him, and they needed to come and, and repent. And when they have heard this, they were prick in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent. You see, God demands repentance. What is repentance? Repentance is when you change your mind. You change your mind about, about doing something, okay? I'm going this direction, doing my thing, stealing, or... or or uh, being envious or jealous or whatever the case may be, doing this thing, and if I repent, I'm going to change around, and I'm going to go in a different direction, leaving that sin behind me. God demands repentance. You see, today what many people do, they want to come to God, ask Him to forgive them, and they want to continue doing their sin. That's the problem. That's the problem. God says repent. You got to turn from your sin. I told you before when he cut that woman, that woman that was caught in adultery, God told her, go your way and sin no more. God wants us to repent. It says repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sins. Jesus Christ is the only one that can take away sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's the, that's, the, that's the key point about this whole thing. You know when Peter got done preaching that day. I think it was 3,000 people. Uh, verse 41 says. Then they that gladly received this, this, his word were baptized. And the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So 3,000 people believed that Jesus Christ was Lord. They repented of their sins, and they were added to the church. That was a very amazing day. That was the beginning of the church right there that day. The day of Pentecost. You see, it was a very different attitude 
that Peter and the other apostles exhibited as compared to when Jesus was arrested. We talk about that in Sunday school as well. When they were arrested, when Jesus was arrested, all of them fled away. They were scared. When the, when the Holy Spirit indwelled them, it was a different story. Because God said, I have not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So they have a completely different reaction because they were indwelled by the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost was empowering them to accomplish the work of God. And so it is with us today. If we're going to do God's work in this place, and great and mighty things are going to happen, it's, going, it's not going to be based because we're so talented, and we know so much, but it's going to be, it's going to be because God's Holy Spirit is having free reign, and he's accomplishing that work. We have to come to the place where we are relying upon his power in our lives. Which I told you before, if we want him to have the preeminence, if we want him to be in control, that means that we have to surrender. I keep telling you about this, right? There's some things that I keep hitting, right? I keep hitting these themes. Why? Because it's very important that we understand these concepts. If the Holy Ghost is going to do a mighty work among us, we are going to have to surrender, yield control of our lives, and let him be in charge. Let him have the steering wheel. And we're going to step aside. And let him have control of our lives. The problem comes when many of us are not willing to do so. We're not willing to surrender because we still want to be in control. That's a problem. That's a problem that limits God's power. I mean, God's power doesn't change, but he cannot manifest himself through us because sometimes we're stubborn and hard-headed. And we want to get our way. Just like that child at store that throws a tantrum, right? Have you seen people like that, those little kids? And even adults, they throw a tantrum because they're not getting what they want. That's a problem. God doesn't work with people like that. God works with people that are surrender. Surrender. Let him have control. And then he can work through you. That's what's required. Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for the history of the early church and how great and mighty things were accomplished those days. Oh, God, we know that your power has not diminished. Your hand has not been shortened. Your ability has not gone away. We know that you're the same yesterday and today and forever. And, God, we know that you're able to do the great and mighty things that that were accomplished during, during these days, even in our day. And God, we desire to see great and mighty things happen in this place that no one can, can explain away because it was done based on your power. Oh, Jesus, help us to be willing to yield, surrender to your will. In Christ's name I pray, amen.